Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecigalanos. I am the Executive Manager of the World Stroke Academy, the educational platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that I am hosting today's uh, educational activity on diagnosis and management of CVST, as this is the result of a magnificent collaboration together with the American Heart and American Stroke Association. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Michelle Brands and Stephanie Moore for their support in this partnership, as we really strongly believe that organizations are just better together. Now, before introducing today's moderator, today's speakers, today's topic, let's have a quick look at some of the housekeeping rules for today. Uh, of course, we welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those, which is in your Zoom control panel. We have also prepared some poll questions that we invite you to participate in when we launch them. You can use, of course, the chat box if you want to say hi or just leave your feedback throughout the webinar. Um, I also want you to note that this webinar is recorded and live streamed on YouTube and that the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar. And lastly, I kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey, which will pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to today's moderator, Dr. Gustavo Saposnik, Editor-in-Chief of the World Stroke Academy. Welcome, Gustavo. Thank you, Laura. And, uh, good morning, good evening, and good night, uh, everyone. This is a great pleasure, as Laura mentioned, of uh, being able to have the first uh, showing uh, webinar between the American Heart Association and the World Stroke Organization. This is an outstanding, we have an outstanding uh, uh, a series of uh, uh, presentations and speakers, all very well-known professors of neurology, uh, starting with uh, um, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, Coutinho, very well-known, is probably one of the faces of cerebral venous thrombosis in the world, uh, followed by Talia Pio, uh, who is also a professor of neurology from uh, uh, Canada in British Columbia, also being recognized for her work on cerebral venous thrombosis. Karen Fury, the last uh, speaker, is going to also talk about a relatively, you know, uh, new topic on cerebral venous thrombosis in the context of uh, uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, uh, and uh, again, she has uh, published the uh, guidelines for the management of this uh, um, uh, specific topic. Anyway, and. Uh, and welcome everyone. This is very exciting time and uh, part of the housekeeping. We are going to start with a couple of questions for you. Please try to fill them up. It's very quickly. Uh, we will give you 20 to 30 seconds to uh, answer and uh, then we will go over. There are no right or wrong questions. And at the end of the day, like, uh, we would like to know about your practice. So poll number one, and uh, um, we, you can get started. So should endovascular treatment routinely be used in patients with severe cerebral venous thrombosis? Yes or no? So just feel free to start voting. And then you can move on to the second question whenever you are done. So we'll give you 20 to 30 seconds, okay? Okay, so here we have the answers. Uh, yes, one third of the uh, uh, voters. And in terms of the, based on the evidence of a uh, uh, craniectomy, uh, uh, um, uh, how many, so what is the expecting uh, 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 independency or modifying rankings uh, scale, 5%, 10%, 33%. So the great majority voted by 33%. And that's uh, great. And uh, the first speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, 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 Dr. Coutinho, so who is going to talk about diagnosis, endovascular, and surgical management of cerebral venous thrombosis. 
Jonathan, welcome and thank you very much for showing us and for being flexible uh, to accept this uh, presentation. Thank you. Just moving up, excellent. Jonathan, I think you are in mute, so you can unmute yourself and if you want and get started. Can you hear me now? Yep. So for some reason, I don't have the controls to start my video. That's one of the things. Can you go uh, to the arrows oh. at the bottom? No, that doesn't work. But uh, I think Laura is fixing it for me. And I think she's now started my video. Do you see me now? Yes. Okay. So let's see if I can move these slides forward as well. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, um, uh, Gustav. I'm sorry for uh, slowing things down a little bit. So I'm going to start my talk. So I'll be talking about diagnosis, endovascular, and surgical management. So it's a bit of a mix-up. So, so Dr. Fields, Alia Field, will be talking about epidemiology and anticoagulation. We mix it up a little bit. Um, so let's see. Yeah, these are my disclosures. So again, these are the three topics I'm going to be talking about today. And I I've added a disclaimer because nowadays I think it's important to add this. And that is that even though I've been working on FIT quite a bit over the last uh, couple of months, uh, this talk does not apply to cerebral venous thrombosis after COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, so please uh, do not use any of the recommendations I'll be giving uh, for these patients, but please look at their specific recommendations, for instance, by the AHA or the ISTH on VIT treatment. Okay, so if we talk about the anatomy, uh, and I'm I just have one slide on this, I always find it helpful to differentiate the cerebral venous system in a superficial venous system and a deep venous system. And if you run and read up uh, more, I highly recommend this paper. It's already about 15 years old by, uh, by Dr. Leach and others, but it's, it's, it's still very helpful. And you can see here the areas that are color-coded here on the left in the hemispheres on both sides. Uh, those are the areas that are drained by the superficial venous system. And that is mostly done through cortical veins that then drain into the superior sagittal sinus. And the deep venous system, as you can see here, which is the deeper white matter, the basal ganglion, the thalami, that is drained through the deeper cerebral veins, for instance, the internal cerebral veins or the basal vein of Rosenthal, and which then drain into the straight sinus. Now, to diagnose CVT, there are, of course, various techniques to do this, but nowadays, 99.9% .9 of all cases, they'll be diagnosed either with MRI, with MR phonography, or CT phonography. I've listed a couple of other options, but in, again, you usually will never need them. Um, I think for to diagnose the CVT itself, both MRI and CT, CT phonography, are sufficient. Um, uh, it depends on what you have access to, I think. I do think that MRI with time of flight MR phonography, so non-contrast enhanced, which is used quite often, can be sometimes a little bit misleading. Contrast enhanced MR phonography is clearly superior, but it's not done in all centers. If you do an MRI with MR phonography, uh, please always look at a combination of a change in signal in the uh, regular sequences, T1 or T2, like in this sagittal T1 sequence, you can see that there's a hyperintensity in the superior sagittal sinus. And then look at your MR phonography, where you should then see at that same location an absence of flow in that specific sinus. And that is then the combination that, that proves that there is indeed a cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, of course, to look at the brain parenchyme, MR, MRI is clearly superior, but I'm still going to show you a couple of images of CT because I think in most of the cases, when you see um, uh, brain parenchymal lesions like intracerebral hemorrhage or cerebral edema, edema, these patients will come in through the emergency room uh, and usually they will get uh, a CT in the first place. So it really helps to recognize certain patterns to, to identify patients with CVT. And I think here you can see an image, which is a case from our hospital that has 
uh, what we typically call a venous hemorrhagic infarct. Now, I still use the term venous hemorrhagic infarct, even though I, I'm convinced that it's technically incorrect and we should be looking for a different term because the edema that you see here, the darker areas, is usually not cytotoxic edema. It's almost always vasogenic edema. Um, but they have these areas, these patches of hemorrhage within it. And that is the typical combination of, of venous congestion that you will see in these patients. This is a very specific type of hemorrhage that is not as common as I, I showed you before, but still it's useful to recognize. And, and we called this a juxtacortical hemorrhage in a paper a few years back. And you can see why, because this patient unfortunately uh, died and we had an autopsy and you can see that the, the hemorrhage, this is the same hemorrhage as you can see in this CT. You can see that it's just below the cortex and it follows the curvature of the cortex. And these are small, almost bean-like um, hemorrhages that can occur single or multiple. Uh, usually in thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. And why I'm showing you this is that it's, it has a very high specificity. If you see this in a patient, it has a specificity of 98% to predict that this patient has cerebral venous thrombosis. And because of the bean-like appearance, one of our neuroradiologists in our hospital has coined the term cashew nut sign for this, um, for this specific type of bleed. This is another one, which I think uh, can be helpful. It's thrombosis of the deep venous system. Now, if you look at the right image, the MRI, it's quite clear, right? You see edema in the uh, basal ganglia, the, the thalami region, the, the head of the coded nucleus. Uh, but if you look only to the CT, it can be a little bit more difficult to see, it, right? So, so imagine you don't have the MRI here. You have, really have to appreciate that there's a slight hyperintenuation of the head of the caudate nucleus, but because it's so symmetrical, it's often overlooked in the acute phase. And you can also see the hyperintensity in the, the hyperintensity in the uh, uh, deeper, the internal cerebral veins, which is indicative of a thrombus there. But again, because it's so in the midline, sometimes it's overlooked. So if, if you know this pattern, and especially if you have a patient that comes in with a decreased consciousness, you should always be aware of, of CVT. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the therapy part. Again, I'm not going to discuss all therapies. I've listed uh, most of the therapies that we use in these patients. I'm just going to focus on endovascular treatment and decompressive surgery. And we're going to provide you the most recent evidence-based um, uh, data that we have on both these topics. So let's first go to endovascular treatment. So if we talk about EVT for, CV, for cerebral venous thrombosis, it can either be chemical thrombolysis with any uh, uh, thrombolytic drug, or it can be mechanical thrombectomy, although mechanical thrombectomy is much more uh, often more used nowadays. The aim is, of course, to achieve faster recanalization of the major sinuses, but of course, there is a potential risk of bleeding. And until very recently, there was no evidence from any randomized controlled trials. This is the reason we did the TUAC trial, the thrombolysis or anticoagulation trial. And uh, this trial was published in uh, JAMA Neurology uh, last year. So if you want to read up on it, you can look at that paper. Uh, it was an investigator-initiated randomized controlled trial uh, where we randomized patients with a severe, so severe cases with a high probability of poor outcome. And they were randomized between standard treatment or standard treatment with endovascular treatment on top. The primary endpoint was the modified ranking scale at 12 months. And originally, we hoped to recruit 164 patients, but the DSMB recommended to terminate the trial after the first interim analysis because of futility. So I, I said, as I said, we included patients with a severe CVT, and that was defined as having one of the following. Patients had to be comatose, have a mental status disorder, an intracerebral hemorrhage, or thrombosis of the deep venous system, because these are the disease factors that, that predict poor outcome for the most part. So in the end, 67 patients were randomized, 33 to endovascular treatment, and 34 to standard treatment. Uh, and we had um, a follow-up data on all patients. There was one patient that, that missed their 12-month follow-up, but we had six-month follow-up in that patient. So we had follow-up data pretty much complete in all patients. And here you can just briefly see what kind of patients were included in the trial. Age was around 40, uh, mostly females, as, as is, of course, common in CVT. Um, you can see they had a median NIHSS of 12, which is quite high for CVST. Um, almost half of them had seizures and, and a high proportion of patients were in coma, as is expected, of course, because of the baseline criteria, the inclusion criteria. And as you can see, intracerebral hemorrhage was quite common, occurring in two thirds to three quarters of all patients. Yeah, for some reason, this graph is, is rotated. That happens more often. I think it's like a MacBook versus Windows issue, but it doesn't really matter. This is the primary endpoint of the trial. And the most important part of the primary endpoint is listed here because the primary endpoint was the dichotomized modified ranking scale. So an MRS of zero to one, meaning complete recovery without any disability. And you can see that there was absolutely no difference between the two groups. 
67 and 68 percent. Okay, so for the last part, we're going to move to decompressive hemicraniectomy. And I think decompressive hemicraniectomy should be reserved for a specific group of patients. And those are the patients that have very large venous infarcts with both clinical and radiological signs of impending herniation. So clinical signs, meaning they'll usually be comatose or at least a decreased consciousness, uh, uh, sometimes with uh, uh, unilateral or bilateral uh, fixed and dilated pupils. And radiological signs you can see over here, for instance, this is a patient that we published uh, previously. Um, this patient came in with a, um, a hematoma and intracerebral hemorrhage due to CVT in the left temporal lobe, was put on heparin treatment, then deteriorated. And here you can see that there was a massive increase in the size of the lesion with also uh, um, a mass effect with midline shift towards the right and, and starting uh, um, uh, obstruction hydrocephalus developing. And this patient became comatose. And those are the patients that I think you should consider decompressive surgery. I guess it's a little similar to uh, decompressive surgery in a malignant MCA infarction. Now, based on retrospective data, the outcome after decompressive surgery, so patients like this, was very, very good. This was published in 2011. There was a good outcome in more than half of all patients and only 16% mortality. And this was one of the reasons that this was added to the guidelines saying, yeah, you should definitely consider this, even though no randomized trials have ever been performed. Of course, these retrospective data were promising, but we also know that they can be sometimes misleading. And that's why um, a group led by Dr. Ferru from Lisbon, who's in, uh, one of the most uh, well-known CVT um, uh, physicians in the world and researchers, uh, we decided that prospective data were required. And this became the Decompress uh, 2 study, which was a prospective international cohort study in which consecutive patients with CVT who were treated with decompressive surgery were included from in total 15 centers in 10 countries. You can see that in total, 118 patients were included. And these slides and these data come, uh, they're not yet published, but they were presented by uh, Sanjeet Aron and Jose Ferru at, uh, at this year's European Stroke Organization Conference. You can see that in total, 118 patients were included. Along the line, we lost some patients for the most part because of patients dying and there were some follow-ups, but still we had follow-up data in most of these patients. Oh, it's too bad that and there's no shift because uh, there was a, a different slide before this, but that's okay. Um, before it were the six month and the discharge MRS, but here you can see the 12 month uh, MRS, which is uh, the, the most important outcome anyway. So don't look at this picture yet. We're going to get to this one later. So here is the 12 month outcome in those 118 patients in the decompressed two study. And the first thing that you can see is that mortality is, is uh, almost one third. So one third of these patients were dead at 12 months after the decompressive surgery. The other thing you can notice that around, if you look at the, the black, the light blue and the yellow group, which is a modified rank scale of zero, one or two, meaning that's the group that's functionally independent after one year is also around one third. And the remaining one third of these patients are dependent in one way or the other. But I think it is important to notice that the group of patients that are most severely affected, so modified ranking skill four or five, is actually quite small. It's only around 10%. And, and I would argue that that's the, um, I would say, the worst outcome after decompressive surgery, right? I mean, um, um, uh, obviously, you want the patient to have a good recovery. But after that, I personally would would um, would would choose... Well, I mean, I think a lot of people would maybe choose death even over being alive with such a severe handicap. Of course, this may vary from country to country, but but that's my opinion. And I've put the, the comparison um, uh, slide from the um, meta-analysis from Fahidi and, uh, and others in Lancet Neurology on the effects of decompressive surgery and malignant MCA infarction. So this is trial data, right? This is a meta-analysis of three trials. But just from comparison, you can see here that in the after MCA infarction, only 14% of patients achieved MRS 0 to 2. There were no zeros and ones compared to one third here, while mortality was slightly lower after in these trials. But you can see the group of patients that was severely affected MRS 4 and 5 is much higher after MCA infarction than after CVT. And I think this shows the general good outcome of patients with CVT if you get them through that acute phase. In the decompressed two uh, study, there was also a question posted to both patients and caregivers at 12 months. So this is only the group of patients, of course, that were alive and their caregivers. Um, and the question was very simple. Looking back at your current situation, would you still have gone for decompressive surgery 
or do you think in hindsight that it was a bad decision? That was the question basically. And you can see that the absolute majority of these patients and both the caregivers said, yes, given the same circumstances, we would, we would still agree with going for decompressive surgery. So I think that's an important patient-centered outcome of this study. I do want to put it in perspective with the retrospective data. Like I said, the retrospective data on decompressive surgery, we were very optimistic and, and we should uh, be humbled slightly because they're not as good as they were in the retrospective data, which again is something you would expect. I'm not going to go through all of the data, but for instance, look at the MRS lower than three. So that's again, the group that is functionally independent. Again, that was around one third in, a pro in the decompressed perspective study, while that was more than two thirds of patients in the retrospective data. So clearly the outcome is not as good as, as uh, based on the retrospective data. And I think this is a, a better um, uh, showing of the true outcome of these patients. And the other part is that you can see that mortality, which was really low in the retrospective data was slightly higher again with around one third. That brings me to my take home messages. Um, I have three. First, I would say use either CT phonography or MRI with MR phonography to diagnose CVT. I don't think that endovascular treatment should be routinely used to treat CVT. So that comes back to the question that was uh, posted be before the talk. Uh, in my opinion, it should not be routinely used. The guidelines have not made a decision yet based on the 2 act trial. And it's interesting to hear maybe some thoughts of people who do think it should be routinely used. And finally, I think decompressive surgery should be used to treat patients with CVT who have both clinical and radiological signs of impending brain herniation. With that, I'd like to thank all the people that I've worked with on CVT over the past years. And uh, we also have an, a consortium, which is the International Cerebral Venous Thrombosis Consortium. And you can go to our website on cerebralvenousthrombosis.com and uh, you can find all the information on ongoing studies. And if you want to join, there's always the option to send us an email. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the uh, great presentation and uh, going through the uh, 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 management of cerebral venous thrombosis, especially endovascular thrombectomy. I have several questions for you. So uh, I mentioned to the uh, um, um, members of the audience over 500 that we will answer those in the Q&A section at the end. So uh, Laura, uh, can we pull the yeah, second, second uh, uh, set of questions? So you have 20 to 30 seconds, please answer those. Don't be shy. So this is important. There is no right or wrong answers. This is just to know what's your practice. So the first question is, how long should people with cerebral venous thrombosis be anticoagulated for in the absence of a permanent indication for treatment? Three months, six months, 12 months, depending on the result of the repeat CTV or MRV or lifelong. And then you can go through the other uh, uh, questions and answer those. And perhaps, uh, Atalia, if you have control, then you can move or, or expand the uh, window. Let me, oh, I, I did it. Okay, good. So, ready? So you have 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so these are the answers. So uh, the most, uh, for the first question, uh, uh, over uh, near 50% agree that, you know, it will be six months of anticoagulation. If you repeat the neurovascular, uh, uh, vascular neuroimaging sensitivity after discharge, when do you repeat imaging? Most people answer three months. And for the final question, do you routinely use DOAX, so direct oral anticoagulants to treat cerebral venous thrombosis? And the great majority, 37% says uh, in some cases, but never acu uh, acutely. And uh, now I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Talia Phil. Uh, she has uh, a recent publication in Shaman Neurology about uh, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and the association with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, vaccine-induced uh, um, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis. She's going to talk about epidemiology and antithrombotic therapy. Thank you, Talia, and welcome. Thanks so much, Dr. Saposnik, and thank you to everyone for the opportunity to be speaking today. Um, I will just move straight ahead. And uh, 
As Jonathan mentioned, we'll kind of be doubling back. Uh, so I'll be discussing epidemiology and antithrombotic treatment of cerebral venous thrombosis. These are my disclosures. And let's get started. So cerebral venous thrombosis, as we know, is a rare cause of stroke. Uh, overall, it accounts for about 1% of all stroke in different observational series. And what we also know about cerebral venous thrombosis is that at least in observational series, uh, the rates tend to be higher in women and in particular younger people, especially women of childbearing age. And that's because of its predisposition to being associated with both the oral contraceptive pill and also in the postpartum postpartum period. Uh, although it's a rare cause of stroke, cerebral venous thrombosis is one of the more common causes of stroke associated with pregnancy as compared to ischemic uh, stroke and intracerebral hemorrhage, which are about uh, 12 out of every 100,000 live births. Cerebral venous thrombosis is almost as common with nine out of 100,000 live births. What's interesting is if you look at health services data where they're looking at administrative coding to identify cases of cerebral venous thrombosis, uh, we notice, first of all, that report reported incidence is higher than what's been previously reported in older series. Previously, it was closer to about, you know, five to 10 per million. Now in series, it's uh, closer to 10 to 20 per million per year. And, you know, as we know, that's far less common than more uh, typical types of venous thromboembolism, like deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Um, but what's interesting is that the increasing rates may just be due in part to the fact that we are better with ascertainment, uh, given the fact that we more routinely use vascular neuroimaging. The other thing that's a bit interesting is that when you look at the health services data, um, you know, we typically talk about observational series and this much higher uh, predisposition towards cerebral venous thrombosis affecting women. In some health services data research, we actually find that there are slightly higher proportions of men than what's reported in observational series, still more women in general. But one thought is that the higher proportion of men in health services research may be due to variable inclusion of cerebral venous thrombosis associated with head trauma. Um, which tends to be more common in men. Um, this is recent uh, health services data from the United States. And as you can see, uh, so this is uh, cerebral venous thrombosis in men. This is in women. You can still see it's much more common, but you can see in both groups, it's increasing over time. What this study also found, which is uncommon, uh, to investigate in health services data right now is that in uh, there, there seem to be uh, uh, racial ethnic differences in terms of uh, uh, incidence. And that may do, be due in part to a number of things, not necessarily uh, genetic uh, or environmental susceptibility, but also perhaps some elements of social determinants of health. And, and this requires further study, um, but it was reported as being more common in uh, people who identified as black, followed by uh, uh, whites and then uh, Asian people. So moving ahead, um, as I mentioned, cerebral venous thrombosis is often associated with oral contraceptives or uh, in the postpartum period. And it can also be associated with a number of other factors. Uh, at least in uh, approximately three quarters of cases, there's at least one predisposing factor that's often identified. Um, and what's interesting is that very recently, there was the first study ever uh, of a genome-wide association study uh, looking at uh, uh, different gene locus that might have been associated with cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, it was the first time that ABO blood type uh, locuses were associated with uh, uh, risk of cerebral venous thrombosis, and in particular, uh, type O blood was less commonly associated with cerebral venous thrombosis than other blood types. Dr. Fury is going to be talking about uh, CVT in association with both COVID and COVID vaccination, so, so stay tuned for that. Um, Moving forward, um, we know that with cerebral venous thrombosis, anticoagulation remains first line therapy in almost all cases. Um, and some people are a bit unnerved because often with cerebral venous thrombosis, there's a proportion of people that will have some amount of blood on their scans. Uh, more recently, we're trying to tease apart kind of the uh, degree of hemorrhage, uh, petechial hemorrhage versus larger uh, parenchymal hemorrhages. So I can't give you those exact numbers in terms of uh, what's more common, but overall uh, about uh, a little more than a third of patients will have some amount of blood on their scans. 
Regardless, anticoagulation remains the standard of care. Unlike in primary intracerebral hemorrhage, the uh, impetus for the bleeding is a drainage problem as opposed to an arterial bleeding problem. So if we're able to uh, anticoagulate and remove the clot, uh, the impetus for the bleeding uh, will be decreased. So we're not just trying to facilitate recanalization of the acute thrombus. We're also uh, treating the uh, underlying hypercoagulable state in addition to preventing further clot extension. Um, there will be a proportion of patients that have some amount of uh, bleeding, but that not, is not necessarily associated with having baseline bleeding on the scan. Approximately 10% of patients will have some amount of later bleeding, but again, uh, overall, the uh, benefits of anticoagulation outweigh the risks. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is that there's been a recent study by our colleagues in Portugal showing that recanalization can actually begin very shortly after the initiation of anticoagulation. Um, they did prospective imaging with both uh, re-imaging of the uh, vessels both at one week after initiation of anticoagulation as well as at 90 days. And what they found is that recanalization can begin uh, very early in the one week scan, approximately 65% of patients had partial recanalization already. And the other thing that they found is that recanalization was associated with resolution of some parenchymal changes on neuroimaging. And I'll show you some examples. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that uh, although anecdotally we seem to think that uh, delayed diagnosis of cerebral venous thrombosis tends to be associated with worse prognosis, this hasn't yet been borne out in the literature, but it's probably because um, the timeframes are not that nuanced when uh, in the previous literature defining kind of early presentation is 48 hours, whereas kind of subacute presentation is anywhere between 48 hours to 30 days. And you can imagine that there's a, a gradation of delays uh, of diagnosis and timing of restarting anticoagulation within that time frame. So certainly earlier diagnosis and treatment is the most desirable way to go. Um, and uh, in terms of kind of the initial anticoagulant in terms of what you choose to use, uh, there is uh, variable recommendations uh, depending on what guidelines you're looking at. The older AHA, ASA guidelines recommend either unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin. The European guidelines, which are more recent, recommend use of low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin, though they do note that it's low quality of evidence and a weak recommendation. And it's extra extrapolated from observational data that show lower risk of mortality and hemorrhage with low molecular weight heparin in uh, DVT uh, and uh, pulmonary embolism, as well as observational data that show a uh, trend towards improved uh, modified Rankin scales and less hemorrhage with low molecular weight heparin. Though again, this is observational data, so there may have been bias and confounding by indication. There has never been a head-to-head -head trial looking at unfractionated versus low molecular weight heparin. Um, what is more desirable about low molecular weight heparin in most cases is that there is a longer duration of anticoagulant effect and re more reliable pharmacokinetics. You can use fixed doses and you don't need to do constant PTTs in order to uh, check that the uh, anticoagulation is therapeutic. There's also a lower risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with low molecular weight heparin as compared to unfractionated heparin. However, there are some cases where unfractionated heparin is going to be more desirable. For example, if you think there's going to be an imminent surgical uh, indication, you may want uh, anticoagulant that you can reverse more quickly. It's also preferred in patients with severe renal impairment. And, and just to show you the variability of practice, this is Canadian data. We did a survey of uh, neurologists and hematologists as to what their preferred first agents for anticoagulation were with acute cerebral venous thrombosis and uh, uh, the bright red is unfractionated heparin and the uh, uh, dark pink is uh, low molecular weight heparin. So you can see uh, kind of that's, uh, that first choice is pretty evenly divided there. In terms of how long you anticoagulate for, so after the acute phase with parenteral anticoagulation, there's a transition over to oral anticoagulation and duration can be variable. Uh, you saw enough variability during your own answers for the uh, pre-presentation poll. Um, guidelines recommend anywhere between three to 12 months for people that don't have a permanent indication for anticoagulation. There is a current trial uh, ongoing led by our colleagues in Portugal called X 
COA where they're examining duration of vitamin K antagonist anticoagulation, looking at three to six months versus 12 months. Um, and uh, whether or not we uh, use recanalization on repeat neuroimaging to uh, guide how long we anticoagulate for, uh, the jury is out on whether or not that is a helpful strategy. I'll show you some data in a minute. Um, what we do know what's interesting is that even though kind of even longer durations of anticoagulation uh, tend to be at uh, approximately one year, if you look at the duration of follow-up and uh, recurrence of any sort of venous thromboembolism, whether that's DVT or PE, or whether that's cerebral venous thrombosis, you can see that it's kind of a linear increase in risk over time, as opposed to what we think of, say, with minor stroke or TIA, where the risk of recurrence is very front loaded. Um, and uh, the risks reported in the uh, literature are slightly variable. And it's also because, you know, it's, it's a rare cause of stroke and long term studies are few and far between. Um, but the risk of recurrence that's reported is about two to 4% per year for all cause venous thromboembolism. Um, we know that patients who are at higher risk of recurrence who don't have a permanent indication for anticoagulation are similar to that with we see in other types of venous thromboembolism, people who are male, people who have uh, genetic thrombophilias, uh, or uh, people that have an idiopathic cerebral venous thrombosis with no identified risk factors. So yes, it's unclear whether or not recanalization uh, on repeat neuroimaging is an optimate strategy to guide your anticoagulation duration. Um, this is meta-analysis data, again, from our colleagues in Portugal, looking at the association between recanalization and prognosis, uh, mainly a, a number of smaller observational studies. But what they did find is that there is an increased odds of a better functional outcome in patients who uh, achieve either partial or or full recanalization. Though again, the directionality with that relationship is not entirely clear. What's interesting is that in the few prospective studies, so there was a, a sub-study from a recent randomized trial. Um, and uh, it's a bit hard to tell because most patients achieved a, a good MRS. 91% of patients had an MRS of zero to one. But within that uh, study, they did not find any association between recanalization, which occurred in about two thirds of patients uh, and uh, better prognosis. We certainly need further prospective study to determine whether recanalization should guide our antithrombotic strategy. Um, and uh, in, in particular, I think we need to be more inclusive in the studies of people that uh, are likely to have uh, poorer outcomes, including people with kind of a severe burden of uh, uh, clot and people with earlier mortality. Um, I had mentioned that uh, in earlier uh, uh, slides that recanalization appears to be associated in prospective studies with uh, better uh, at least radiological prognosis. Uh, this is the prospective study I was talking about where they did repeat neuroimaging both at one week and at 30 days. And what was interesting is that in people that had earlier recanalization, there tended to be improvement uh, in patients that had non-hemorrhagic lesions with regards to reduced size of hemorrhagic lesions or uh, uh, reversal. Um, however, there was a proportion of people, like I said previously in series, it's about 10%. So in this series, 12% percent had a new hemorrhagic lesion. Um, most, uh, so, so uh, most people were uh, achieving at least partial recanalization. So over 90% had either partial or full recanalization by day 90. And in some people, there was complete resolution of parenchymal lesions, even lesions that we have previously thought about as being due to cytotoxic edema. So this is a patient uh, uh, who initially had uh, restricting lesions on MRI at baseline with flare changes, but you can see there's complete reversal at day 90. So, you know, what we're learning about cerebral venous thrombosis is that this is certainly a disease that behaves differently, even kind of at the parenchymal level uh, than ischemic stroke. Um, the other thing that they found, you know, similarly to uh, the sub-study from uh, the RESPECT CVT trial is that there was no association between recanalization and prognosis, uh, though the study was not powered to show that difference. So, so um, what we do know is that recanalization begins early, but we'll still need more prospective study in order to determine whether or not recanalization is associated with better prognosis.
So again, I noticed that there is some variability as to whether or not people feel comfortable using direct acting oral anticoagulants as opposed to vitamin K antagonists for uh, prevention of cerebral venous thrombosis and uh, 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 secondary prevention. So what we do know is that there is well-established safety and efficacy of DOAX with uh, other types of venous thromboembolism. Uh, they've demonstrated non-inferiority or superiority depending on the trial compared to vitamin K antagonists. And we know that there's also also a 50% relative risk reduction of intracerebral hemorrhage with these agents. Um, but uh, uh, there are certain populations where uh, DOAC use is not routinely recommended, such as uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and some other situations. Um, but what's interesting is that, um, you know, you would extrapolate that probably if we can use it in more common forms of venous thromboembolism, use of DOAX may be appropriate for cerebral venous thrombosis. And fortunately, there is emerging literature that is suggestive of a reassuring safety profile for DOAX in CVT. Um, and uh, uh, more literature is accumulating. What we don't know is what the optimal timing is to initiate therapy as compared to parental, uh, per, uh, parenteral therapy. Dosing uh, optimal agents uh, are unclear, um, and adequately powered trials to demonstrate a difference in terms of prognosis uh, are not uh, available, though we will be able to pool existing data from smaller studies going forward. Um, the AHA guidelines are a bit too old to account for uh, DOEX, but but in the more recent European guidelines, uh, prior to the release of some of the uh, more recent studies, they did not recommend routine use of the direct oral anticoagulants for the treatment of cerebral venous thrombosis, particularly during the acute phase, but again, acknowledged that the quality of evidence was very low and a weak recommendation overall. So more recently, the RESPECT CBT trial has come out. This was an international study run by our colleagues uh, in Portugal and in the Netherlands. Uh, they randomized patients to either uh, uh, dabigatran versus warfarin uh, and treated patients for six months. Uh, the primary outcome was major bleeding, both extracranial and intracranial, as well as recurrent venous thromboembolism. And uh, higher risk patients with infection or trauma or malignancy were not included in the trial. Um, about half of patients recruited were women with a mean age of 45. And as I mentioned, uh, most people achieved a favorable outcome at six months. And there was no difference between the two groups in terms of the uh, achieved functional outcomes. Um, there was no venous thromboembolism recurrence in either group. And uh, one GI bleed in the dabigatran group and two intracranial hemorrhages in the warfarin group. And what was interesting too, is that there was no difference in rates of recanalization, again, about two thirds of uh, people in both groups uh, achieved recanalization. Uh, another study has been conducted in children as part of a larger study looking at rivaroxaban for all types of venous thromboembolism. There was a large sub-study of this trial, which was called Einstein Jr., uh, which enrolled patients with cerebral venous thrombosis. In this trial, there was an initial lead-in phase uh, similar to respect CVT with parenteral therapy, and then uh, patients were randomized two to one to rivaroxaban versus standard of care. Um, children were treated for three months months. And uh, basically, there was no uh, uh, major uh, bleeding in the rivaroxaban group, though there was an excess of clinically relevant bleeding. Um, and uh, uh, more than two thirds, uh, more than three quarters of patients uh, achieved uh, partial or complete recanalization. So, you know, there is emerging safety data that is reassuring. Uh, but again, these are uh, smaller studies, uh, not uh, uh, adequately powered, but we will have the opportunity to combine data going forward. In Canada, we're running the secret trial, which is a pilot safety trial, and we've just reached our recruitment targets, and we'll be uh, finishing our 12-month follow-up about a year from now. Uh, just some key differences between our trial and the uh, RESPECT CBT trial. Uh, secret is using rivaroxaban uh, dosing, and uh, initial dosing is 20 milligrams daily. 
Um, and uh, randomization can occur up to day 14. And there is no requirement for lead in parenteral anticoagulation as compared to the RESPECT CVT trial, which initiated dabigatran after uh, parenteral anticoagulation. Um, 50 patients uh, have been recruited, and uh, the primary outcome is a composite of major intracranial and extracranial bleeding, uh, as well as mortality at six months. Uh, but patients will be followed up to 12 months to uh, look at uh, outcomes, including patient-centered outcomes, including uh, uh, cognition and mood and fatigue and uh, uh, other uh, relevant outcomes that uh, are common to uh, survivors of cerebral venous thrombosis. So my take-home messages, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis is more common than what is reported in previous reports. Uh, in observational series, we see that there is a strong female predominance and patients tend to be younger than in other, uh, other studies looking at other types of stroke. Uh, epidemiological series have a slight uh, shift in terms of the sex balance. Anticoagulation remains standard of care and should be given regardless of the presence of hemorrhage in almost all cases. Uh, there is weak evidence uh, in cerebral venous thrombosis and extrapolation from the DVT literature that suggests that low molecular weight heparin may be preferable in, in most cases. Uh, duration of anticoagulation remains variable and the optimal duration is uncertain as is whether to use recanalization to guide duration of anticoagulation. And vitamin K antagonists remain the guideline recommended standard of care treatment, though there is some emerging safety evidence for the direct acting oral anticoagulants and clinical practice is shifting, uh, particularly after the acute phase, but uh, higher quality evidence uh, is pending. So thank you very much. Thank you, Talia, very much for your excellent presentation. Much appreciated. So we move on to the uh, poll number three. There is a before and after. Uh, Dr. Karen Fury is going to uh, uh, present. But before, let's go to the uh, uh, a case scenario. So a 60-year-old man uh, presents with a moderately severe headache and myalgia the day after receiving the, the AstraZeneca vaccine. There are no focal features on the neurological examination. His platelet count is uh, within the normal range, 160. Most likely diagnosis, one, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia with cerebral venous thrombosis, headache caused by an adverse event of the vaccine, acute ischemic stroke, or subarachnoid hemorrhage. 20 seconds, you can start voting. Okay, so 25% uh, VITT, 74 the great majority cause, uh, headache caused by adverse event of the vaccine. The next one, um, do we have another one? No, okay. So we'll go ahead with, uh, I'd like to introduce Karen Fury. You know, she's very well known, the former uh, 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 associate editor of uh, uh, Stroke. And, uh, and now Karen is going to talk about the uh, VITT. Thank you, Karen, for joining and welcome. Thank you, Gustavo. And I want to thank the American Stroke Association and the World Stroke Academy for inviting me. Um, the previous two talks were wonderful. And um, obviously, everyone needs to focus on the more, more, more common presentation of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Um, but recently, uh, it has been identified that uh, certain COVID vaccines can cause um, an induced thrombotic th thrombocytopenia that leads to CVST. And this is a, a somewhat different condition. And so I'm going to, to talk a little bit about the presentation uh, and about the unique management features. Um, before I get started, I do want to declare uh, one disclosure, uh, which is that I have uh, become part of an executive committee for a Janssen uh, clinical trial. So as you know, there are currently four vaccines that are available in Europe and the US. And I apologize that I don't have information about other vaccines that may be used throughout the world. And there have been limited reports outside of those associated um, with the Janssen and AstraZeneca vaccine. What distinguishes these two classes is that Janssen and AstraZeneca 
have non-replicating adenoviral vectors that encode the spike glycoprotein of COVID-19. And that's what induces the immune response and provides protection against COVID infection. The other two vaccines that are commonly used are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And in contrast, they use mRNA in order to generate the immune response in the host. And so early on, it was identified that there may be side effects specific to one particular mechanism of the vaccines as opposed to the other. In the poll that you all just took, the right answer was that the headache in the middle-aged man was due to just side effects of the vaccine itself. And the reason I started the presentation with that is that headache is an incredibly common presenting feature to emergency departments throughout the world. And in particular, patients who are receiving vaccinations with any of the four vaccines I just described often experience headache and myalgias very quickly in, the, in hours to days after vaccination. So it's important to remember that CVST is rare, five cases per million per year. And as um, Talia very nicely described, it's more common in women and it's more common in younger people. And so when you're dealing with someone who doesn't fit the epidemiological picture, and is experiencing stable headache very, very early after vaccination, you should have a broader diagnosis and not immediately assume that you're dealing with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the timeline of how we've learned about the association between CVST and VIT. If you remember back, to um, March of 2021, uh, we were dealing with, um, with COVID infections in our hospitals. Of course, COVID itself is responsible for thromboembolic complications. And many of us were seeing an increase in acute ischemic strokes related to COVID infection. In early March, uh, vaccinations using uh, the Janssen vaccine were started in the United States. And Relatively soon after those vaccinations started, the FDA was made aware of a case of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis after vaccination. Around the same time, reports began to, um, to emerge in Europe as well after vaccination with the AstraZeneca vaccine. In April of 2021, there were a total of six cases of CVST associated with the Janssen vaccine and as a result, vaccinations with that particular vaccine were temporarily paused. Just around the same time, there were reports emerging from Germany, Austria, Norway, reporting an association between CVST and vaccination with the AstraZeneca. It's important to, to recognize that by the time these cases were emerging in the United States, so a total of six cases, there had already been 6.8 million doses of the Janssen vaccine administered. And so even though there was a signal of concern, obviously that was um, enhanced by the fact that there were similar reports emerge, emerging out of Europe, it was still a very low prevalence, similar, and the incidence was similar to what had been reported uh, even in the absence of vaccination. So to drill down on what we knew at that time, this table compares the characteristics of CVST unrelated to COVID vaccines on the left and those that were reported in the COVID vaccine era on the right. As you can see, there are some commonalities in that the majority of, of individuals affected were young and there was a female predominance. The difference really emerged in terms of the hematological characteristics with and uh, the observation that patients who developed CVST after vaccination had thrombocytopenia and antibodies to platelet factor four. So this really distinguished vaccine-associated CVST from the more common garden variety. 
The characteristics of the individual patients that were reported in the US are also interesting. The majority presented with headache. Uh, similar to uh, more common CVST, the right, uh, I'm sorry, the transverse sinus was predominantly affected. There were reports of venous thrombosis in other vascular beds. It was not only related to um, cerebral circulation. And as you can see, these cases were all associated with some degree of thrombocytopenia. And in contrast to the case that I used to start this presentation, where that gentleman's symptoms began the day after the vaccination, all of these cases were diagnosed five to 24 days after the patient received the vaccine. So what is the mechanism of vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia? The thought is that the DNA uh, within the adenoviral vectors somehow leaks into the peripheral circulation and triggers the antibodies to platelet factor four. Those have a direct effect on platelets, but also have an effect on endothelial activation. And the combination of both the platelet effects as well as the endothelial effects leads to systemic thrombosis that can cause cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, systemic venous thrombosis, as well as uh, episodes of arterial thrombosis, including acute ischemic stroke. In, in Talia's talk, you heard about risk factors for CVT. Those include things like thrombotic states, pregnancy, oral contraceptives, drugs, malignancy, inflammatory disorders, but infection is also on that list. So it's important to put the, the case reports of CVST associated with vaccination in context because patients are being vaccinated in order to prevent COVID-19 infection. And this was a very important paper um, that was published uh, uh, soon after these reports began to emerge. And what they demonstrated was that the risk of CVST with COVID infection was significantly higher than that associated with vaccination. And so the logic that individuals might decide not to get vaccinated was really illogical, given that if they contracted COVID, their risk of CVST was five to 12 times higher. Patients who present with CVST after vaccination commonly complain of headache. They may also have other features such as increased intracranial pressure, ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, seizures, and altered level of consciousness. The headache is usually diffuse and it's usually progressive over days to weeks. It can mimic migraine and it can present as a thunderclap headache. And about a quarter of individuals will only have headache. As you've previously heard, the important diagnostic study to obtain is some time type of venogram, either CTV or MRV. And the sensitivity and specificity of both modalities is very high. In addition to the unique elements of uh, the thrombocytopenia and platelet factor four antibody, it's important to recognize that there's a fundamental difference in how this particular condition should be managed. You already heard that in, in Talia's talk that anticoagulation is the mainstay of therapy for CVST. And in fact, that is still true in this manifestation, but because of the overlap with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which also affects platelet factor four antibodies, it's critical to avoid heparin products unless the patient is hit negative. And so some other form of anticoagulation should be used. And I've listed some of the available um, uh, candidates on this slide. So in contrast to the reflex to start heparin or low molecular weight heparin, if a patient has recently received a COVID-19 vaccination, it's critical that the platelet count and platelet factor four antibodies be tested before anticoagulation is started. And if the patients are thrombocytopenic or have platelet factor four antibodies, heparin should be avoided. 
In addition, intravenous immunoglobulin has become the recommended treatment to try and uh, to try and interrupt the antibody effects of the vaccine. Uh, patients should be treated with a gram per kilogram for two days. If platelet counts do not normalize, it is reasonable to consider either steroids or plasma exchange as, uh, as a, a secondary therapy to try and prevent ongoing thrombosis. Once the platelet count normalizes, patients can be transitioned to a direct oral anticoagulant, as Talia very nicely described. It's critical to stay up to date with the latest recommendations. Um, as the medical community internationally learns more about the mechanism of this phenomenon, uh, there may be uh, additional recommendations or um, some clarifications of what we're currently doing. There are lots of unanswered questions associated with this condition. The true risk of CVST associated with COVID-19 infection is not known. It's probably underreported because um, it wasn't previously recognized and not all patients have access to uh, CTV or MRV. It's unclear what the prevalence of platelet factor four antibodies are in patients who might have mild COVID-19 infection or after vaccination because these are not routinely tested. The mechanism of effect is postulated um, and more may be emerging from the hematology realm about how this actually works. And it's unclear whether there are high and low risk subgroups. I'd like to call everyone's attention to a manuscript that was just published this week in JAMA Neurology. Uh, both Talia and Jonathan are co-authors in an international um, collaborative effort to identify uh, patients who had uh, VIT and CVST. And in their manuscript, they were able to compare characteristics of this special population with those lacking uh, thrombocytopenia and compared to a pre-COVID control population. And it, it, it not only provides a larger population, uh, but at which and nice descriptive data, um, they also highlight the poor outcomes in patients who have this constellation of VIT and CVST. I'll put the reference in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Very much appreciated, great talk. Um, so uh, let's get started in the, uh, if you can turn on your uh, cameras, the uh, panelists, and uh, uh, we have the first uh, with the poll number uh, so the uh, post uh, um, uh, question after Karen's uh, talk. Uh, Laura, can we go? You have 20 uh, seconds, okay? A 40-year-old woman presented uh, with a worsening of holocephalic headache eight, eight, uh, eight days after receiving the uh, Janssen COVID vaccine. What is the best cor course of action? One reassure her that the, her headache is a common side effect of the vaccine and recommend she use uh, over-the-counter analgesics. Uh, number two is obtain a non-contra CT. Number three is check a platelet count and order a CT or MRV. And the last one, uh, urgently admit for anticoagulation and plasma exchange. Ready? So please don't be shy and try to answer uh, as soon as possible. 20 seconds and then we'll go to the Q&A section, okay? Okay, 80%, 80, over 80% 80, uh, of people answer check a platelet count and order the CT or uh, uh, MRV. Uh, I don't know uh, if, uh, uh, Karen, do you want to make a comment given that this is the last, uh, the last one? Yep, uh, the 88% are correct. Uh, this is a woman, a young woman. She has an onset of symptoms uh, within that uh, five to 24 day period. Uh, the headache is progressive. Uh, she's received the vaccines that are associated with this condition, and it would be important to exclude VIT as the cause for CVST so that you could initiate the appropriate form of anticoagulation and immune therapy. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Karen. And uh, let's get started with a Q&A. So for the uh, uh, speakers, so we have many, many questions. My apologies to everyone who, uh, you know, posted the question and we may not be able to answer so many. So I ask you to answer, you know, uh, like a very brief, so imagine that you have less than 10 seconds to answer the question, okay? This is a challenge. So the initial question, so let's say, uh, Jonathan, so, one of the questions was, how can we differentiate between the artery of percheron infarction and the deep vein of thrombosis radiologically? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would say do an MRI and uh, a percheron infarction is, it will give DWI lesions, usually always located exclusively in the thalami, while in the case of CVT, it'll be vasogenic edema and usually extending beyond the thalami. And you should see the thrombus as well in CVT. Excellent. Then the next question is, what's the therapeutic window in case of cerebral venous thrombosis? I believe that this is for you, Jonathan, regarding endovascular thrombectomy. What, you mean, when should we do endovascular treatment in these patients? Yes, the, time the therapeutic window. window. It's mentioned therapeutic window between quotation marks. I don't think there's a real therapeutic window as an ischemic stroke, right? Where we count hours. Uh, it, it, it can be days. Uh, I mean, it usually won't be weeks. Once it's weeks, the thrombus will be organized. It's hard to remove, but, but hours to days, I would say. Okay, thank you. The next one is also for uh, probably you or Talia. So after uh, uh, the compressive uh, craniectomy, which day after surgery can you start anticoagulation therapy? Uh, the answer is we don't know. It's going to be one of the side studies of decompressed 2 to look at this. Um, I can only give you my personal recommendation. I would withhold decompressive surgery for uh, 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 anticoagulation for at least 24 to 48 hours, sometimes initiate uh, prophylactic dose, low molecular weight heparin, and after 48 hours, then consider restarting. But you need to consult with your neurosurgeons because um, re uh, bleeds do occur after restarting anticoagulation. It's not that rare in these patients. Thank you, Jonathan. This is essentially what we do and the recommendations in the handbook of neurosurgery for any specific craniectomy. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Shekar mentioned, I feel that the MRI a brain with and without contrast is superior to MRV with contrast. Can you comment your thoughts? I don't really know what is meant here, but but mm -hmm. I think the main difference is like time of flight MR, MRV is clearly um, inferior to contrast and ends. You should really be careful. It is used a lot and you can use it, but you can overdiagnose CVT quite easily. Um, so if it's possible, always do a contrast-enhanced MR phonography. Thank you, Shana. Yeah, excellent. Uh, uh, Talia, so is there any role for D-dimers in the diagnosis or prediction of CBT? So um, there have been a couple of studies. Actually, Jonathan, you're probably the best person to answer that uh, through your review of the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I'll defer to you. Yeah, so what I always say is D-dimer is helpful in the patients where you don't need it, which are the patients that have very acute onset seizures, focal deficits, and those are the ones you're going to image anyway. And the sensitivity drops considerably in the patients where it would be most helpful, like with those with isolated headache, chronic symptoms, where you would say if D-dimer is normal and that would exclude CVT, then I wouldn't do my imaging. So that's the problem with D-dimer. And uh, we published a paper in neurology on a clinical prediction score that may help to categorize risks, and that may help to then select a group of patients where you can use it, similar to the Wells criteria. But in all honesty, I don't think we have enough data. We published a paper and it's a first step, but it needs to be confirmed in separate cohorts before we can really start using it in clinical practice. That, that's my uh, stand. Thank you very much. So the next question is an open question is, how, how do you try to differentiate between chronic and acute cerebral venous thrombosis? One question and the second is, uh, uh, how to uh, choose best treatment uh, for acute and for chronic in the pediatric population. Anyone are welcome to. So, I mean, in terms of acute versus chronic, I mean, I think you've got the clinical picture and the radiological picture. So, you know, first of all, you know, 
when did someone have symptoms that may be in keeping with cerebral venous thrombosis, or is this just an incidental diagnosis that you've picked up on neuroimaging for a separate indication? Um, another thing you'll want to see is, are there evidence, you know, is there evidence kind of of acute problems, you know, is there uh, uh, venous edema or venous hemorrhage, uh, which would probably be more in keeping of a more acute process. Is there evidence of more organized thrombus or partial recanalization, which may be more in keeping with a, a more chronic picture? Um, in terms of how to treat kind of an incidental diagnosis, I think the jury is out. What we do know from extrapolation from the DVT and PE literature is that people with incidental diagnoses have the same uh, recurrence or sa same diagnosis race for uh, malignancy as compared to people with symptomatic diagnoses. So just, just something to keep in mind, but certainly we don't have uh, uh, similar literature in, in the cerebral venous thrombosis population. Um, with regards to pediatric treatment, I mean, certainly I would uh, defer to guidelines. Um, and, uh, you know, with the uh, river oxaban study with Einstein Jr. in many countries, uh, river oxaban uh, uh, that you can dose by, by weight for pediatric suspension is not yet available. So I would still kind of go with uh, usually parenteral therapy with uh, transition in some cases where, where children are able to uh, tolerate vitamin K antagonists uh, as, as indicated. But uh, certainly in uh, discussion with hematologists uh, as well as the uh, pediatric neurologists. Thank you, Talia. You know, it's a shower of questions. My apologies that we may not be able to answer them all. The next question is about, uh, is there, Dr. Chayasak, is there any role of anticoagulants in infections induced cerebral venous thrombosis? For example, meningitis induced cerebral venous thrombosis? Um, you know, I, it's it's controversial. I'll, I'll let uh, Jonathan talk about uh, the, their experience in, in a minute. But in, in general, we do kind of take the approach where we treat uh, infection-associated cerebral venous thrombosis in the same way uh, as we would kind of any other spontaneous uh, cerebral venous thrombosis. Uh, uh, Jonathan, I know you've you've reviewed the uh, available literature. Yeah, I mean, we we looked at these data from the ICVT cohort, and it, it it's it's like like Thalia says, it's 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 variable. People sometimes use it, people sometimes don't use it. We don't have any evidence, like real evidence in these patients. Um, personally, I use it as long as there are no intracranial infection. So in a meningitis case, I would be cautious to use anticoagulation because we do tend to see more hemorrhages. Just if you look at the meningitis patients and you, without the CVT, if you treat a meningitis patient with anticoagulation, the risk of hemorrhages is, is higher. So that's why we're a bit careful but I would say you can argue it in both directions. Karen, thank you. Karen, any uh, evidence of uh, uh, CVST induced by uh, the Pfizer vaccine? This is one question. And the second uh, question was related with why the uh, uh, BITT occurs uh, preferentially after the first, not the second dose or the third dose of the vaccine. So uh, the answer is that this phenomenon has not been seen with the mRNA vaccines, so neither Pfizer nor Moderna. And um, presumably the, the response in susceptible individuals is with the, the first dose of, of vaccine. And of course, um, a potential advantage of using uh, the Janssen and AstraZeneca are that they don't require serial dosing the way that the mRNA vaccines do. So, um, so patients, we don't, we don't have any experience about giving boosters in that population, but possibly in the near future. With the AstraZeneca, we do, it requires two doses. Do? But, Janssen uh, does not, yeah. Yeah, AstraZeneca does. And we, there, there's been a handful of cases. In our series, there was one case after the second dose. But like Karen says, it's probably selection, right? The ones that get it, get it after the first dose. Thank you very much. One other question is from Dr. DiPoggio. Uh, some of the previous questions were anonymous, for example. Should we consider the degree of recanalization when we have to decide to continue or not anticoagulant therapy after the first six months? What's your standard practice, Jonathan, Talia, Karen? Uh, 
I mean, I, I think that the it's it's really not clear uh, based on the existing literature whether recanalization, especially much later, is uh, something that we should be trying to achieve with anticoagulation. You know, we know kind of within three to six months, uh, a majority of people will have at least achieved partial recanalization. Um, and kind of once you're past that chronic phase, you know, I, I don't think we have any convincing evidence that uh, uh, kind of aiming for complete recanalization is going to be associated with better prognosis. Um, but again, you know, I think there is higher quality uh, prospective literature that's that's required to, to clarify the answer to this question. I and agree. If I may, I, uh, sorry. Uh, I also, um, I tend to image at three months to decide whether to continue to six months of therapy. Um, if it's normalized, I'll only treat for three months. Uh, almost all patients come off anticoagulation at six months unless there's an underlying hematological or an autoimmune condition that requires more long-term anticoagulation. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I agree that there's not really any good data. And my main issue with all these studies on recanalization and outcome is that very often they don't look at the things they think they should be looking at because they look at like modified ranking scale and it, like the modified ranking scale is not determined by recanalization. It's determined by severity of brain damage in the acute phase. I think the real answer to, I mean, to look at this, you would want to know, is the risk of recurrent CVT higher in an unrecanalized patient if you stop anticoagulation? And do these patients more often have uh, what we call in the leg, the post-traumatic syndrome, right? Like headache, things like that, more cognitive things that Thalia is looking at in secret. In a secret. I think that would be much more interesting. And then the question is, do you influence that with longer anticoagulation? And as long as we don't have those answers, I don't think there's any reason to, to use uh, your imaging and to decide on the duration of anticoagulation. I'd be quite hesitant to do that. Thank you very much. And Karen, the last question, I think it is directed to you, but specifically is, is about causation. So the, the question is, if a patient uh, has classic risk factors such as dyslipidemia, hypertension, smoking, or even contraception. How do you diagnose that the CVT is caused by a vaccine? <laughs> right. And that's really the problem with a lot of, of the reporting we've seen in the last you know, 18 months around COVID infection and COVID vaccination is how much of it is the background and how much of it is, is causally related. I, in my mind, the, the, compelling, the, the compelling part of this story that makes me think it's related and causal uh, are the consistent findings of thrombocytopenia and antiplatelet factor four antibodies. Um, it's just such an unusual phenomenon uh, that you know, it really uh, it begs credulity that it would be an unrelated event. So I, I do think uh, some some cases, and, and again, I, I put the uh, JAMA neurology reference in, there are some cases even in this time span that don't have thrombocytopenia and antiplatelet factor four antibodies. Um, but, but, they, but again, the ones that I've described are really a subgroup. And I do think it, there's a relationship. If I can add to that, because I agree, but I, I put it even more strongly. I mean, we looked at this, we published it in a separate paper in JAMA uh, two months ago. Like the PF4 antibodies in non-COVID vaccine-related CVT didn't happen. It was like in our group of a thousand patients, we had one case of PF4 antibodies, one. It was extremely rare. And then now that fact that we're seeing this, even though it's still rare, but we're seeing them more often, that settles it. I mean, those cases are related to the vaccine. There's no doubt about that, I think. All the other cases, I would argue, the ones that don't have thrombocytopenia, are probably coincidental. And um, I mean, billions of people have received these vaccines, so they're gonna get rare diseases, including CVT. So, so I would argue only the, VIT, the true VIT cases with the P4 antibodies are caused by the vaccines. All the other ones are probably just a coincidence. And just to remind you also about causation, the principle from Bramford Hill published in, uh, uh, I think it Lancet in the uh, 70s, so the biological plausibility consistency is not about an individual case, but it's an overarching phenomenon that you know, include at least five or, or, or six uh, 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 important topics that were published with our guidelines in, in the American Heart uh, in 2011. Anyway, 
We don't have too much time, unfortunately. There are still over 400 uh, attendees. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, the American Heart. Thank you very much, the uh, World Stroke uh, uh, um, Organization and all the uh, speakers and attendees for uh, such a fantastic uh, 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 webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful discussions, great presentations and questions. Thank you everyone for your warm participation in today's webinar. As I already mentioned, a recorded version of this webinar will be shared with you. And in the meanwhile, you can make sure to follow the World Stroke Academy and the American uh, Heart and American Stroke Association on Twitter and LinkedIn. And we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Take care. Thank you all. Awesome.